want to welcome all of you to our decoding talk of what's coming for the 2019 code. We're going to speak specifically to just low-rise residential, that is single-family homes, that is townhomes, three habitable stories or less, that's duplexes of any size, and that is also any low-rise multifamily, three habitable stories above grade or less. We're going to talk about all of that in this particular session. Our non-rest session was done this morning. We are brought to you by Energy Code ACE. This program is funded by you, the California Utility Rate Payers, and administered by all of the private utilities, of which you see all of their logos and names here. And we are under the auspices of the California Public Utility Commission and definitely in support of the California Energy Commission. My name is Gina Rada, and I'm the host of the Decoding Talk series. I am a full-time energy consultant. That's what I do. I've got here kind of a meandered through other aspects of building design, but stuck to just uh, energy about 12 years ago when I came to work for Gable Energy full-time. My guest speaker is Martin Dodd, who I've known him almost from the first day I joined the industry. Martin, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Well, I'm happy to hear, Jeannie, you're a full-time energy consultant because I'm at the most of the time teaching as <laughs> consultant these days. <laughs> <laughs> I teach a lot of classes. I think, I think I've probably got this year, oh, I think about 120 classes I've got to do, maybe 130. <laughs> so anyway, needless to say, uh, I have been in the industry a lot of years. Um, started back in uh, Berkeley over at the Harmon Street office with Mike Gable. And uh, that's when we developed the uh, Comply24 software, which uh, was then uh, updated into the, uh, the Energy Pro software. So obviously, we do provide software uh, products out to the industry. And um, I also uh, do a bit of consulting, enough to, <laughs> enough to keep my, my skills sharp. That's not true. I do a lot. Of it. But uh, I also do teach a lot of training classes. I find when I teach, though they say those that teach, you know, I see it as a different layer of how we look at the energy code. I also help develop a bunch of the resources for energy code ACE. And let me tell you, that's another way of looking at the code that's sometimes overwhelming. <laughs> um, our goals for you today is uh, we're going to review the major changes associated with the energy code as it just pertains to our residential occupancies with you. We're also going to talk about how we feel it may impact design, modeling, installation, and enforcement that may be associated with these changes. And because Martin and I are very opinionated, we're also going to express our opinions about how things may affect the industry and how prepared we feel the industry is to some of these requirements. Here's my agenda for today. You'll notice I don't have a break on here, so I hope you came prepared for us to use the whole two hours. What we do want you also to do is be aware you can put into that webinar chat any questions, comments, concerns you have as we move throughout this, because I want to make sure you walk out of here having all of your questions answered. So do feel free to interact with us as we go throughout this training. Now that we've asked them, uh, told you a little bit about us, we'd like to know a little bit about you. And this helps Martin and I make sure we know who's in the room and how to speak things a certain way. Uh, first of all, we'd like to know what role do you serve. If by chance you choose the other button, if you can please type into the webinar chat exactly what it is you do so that we can be aware of everyone in the room. And then our question next is, do you feel you're prepared for the 2019 code? And our last question, gosh dang it, why does the energy code become more stringent with each code cycle? So Martin, looks like we have quite a few energy consultants and a nice component of plants examiners with us here this afternoon. And it's always nice to be seeing our designers and engineering uh, teams uh, attending our particular sessions. And oh, I'm not sure I'm liking this, Martin. Almost everyone is feeling they're not prepared for the 2019 code. What concerns you about hearing most of this group is not feeling prepared? Well. What concerns me is that uh, do they feel their clients are prepared for the 2019 code cycle? After all, for many of us, uh, somebody else is designing the building and then handing to us and saying, okay, now it's in your, in your court, get it to comply. And uh, I'm just wondering if people want to respond into the, uh, into the chat as to how they feel about their clients being prepared for this new code 
since this new code is about 52% tougher than the current code we're in. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd love to see if somebody can write into the chat if they are doing a project right now in this code that has been 50% better than code. <laughs> I don't yeah, think who currently now has a project that has over 50% compliance margin? You're going to be fine. <laughs> Emily says, no way. Well, well, Emily, you've got to start working up to that level. <laughs> well, I, we have to admit out loud, i got to say, about 30% of that 50% is the PV. So if we kind of put PV back in there, then we're talking about projects that are about 20% more stringent than what uh, they currently have. And Elizabeth is really honestly bringing up such an important point. We have clients, and I have to say, especially contractors, we don't have any contractors in the room right now, at least they're not raising their hand, not even understanding the current code, Martin. What are our struggles that we're going to have today with just like this, three calls that Elizabeth got today regarding the contractor not following the CF1R, and now we have to try and put a compliant document together regarding something that didn't even follow that plan set. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, I was kind of half chuckling yesterday when one of the participants said, how do I get rid of high-performance addicts? I don't want to do them. It's like, <laughs> good luck. I mean, the high-performance addict is a 20 to 30 percent delta uh, in the current code. Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine what it is in the next code. So there's these things that the code has introduced, and the 2016 code was intended to ease us into things like high-performance walls and high-performance attics. But the 2019 code isn't going to be easing you into anything. You're going to be in a position where it's like, now you, you're going to be doing this. This is, this is the norm come 2019. So just like PV is going to be the norm come 2019. So yeah, I, I, I have, to, have to agree with Beth that it's... Uh, it's tough. And, and uh, you know, one of the biggest things I hear out there is, oh, you know, we specified QII and uh, the contractor didn't do it. It's like, oh, boy. So. Yeah, that one's going to be a tough one. And we'll walk through that with you guys. I have to say the person who responded, CEC is hoping to reach Z&E and reduce energy use from depletable resources. Get rid of that question mark. Okay? You are 100% spot on. Say that with confidence. Um, we, the Energy Commission has goals. It's been a zero net energy goal, but Martin, we're kind of shifting how the Energy Commission is looking at things, aren't we? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. I mean, um, we see with the um, ability with this 2019 code to do all electric homes and a pathway to compliance for all electric homes, a definite shift at the state level uh, towards a, a, a movement to give us the ability to move out of fossil fuels and uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Excellent, everyone. We're going to go back to our presentation and start walking through some of these exciting changes that I know we've got you guys on pins and needles to be finding out about now. <laughs> we've prepped them well, Martin. Let's go a little bit into the why, which we like to start with immediately with our handouts. If everyone can turn their eyes to the left, you'll see a box saying Gina's favorite resources. The very first link there is to the Energy Code Ace website. Of course, I have to give you that one. The second one is to the Online Resource Center at the Energy Commission's website. It's their pathway to be able to find information on their website. It's gone through a complete overhaul, so you might want to check that out and see what it looks and feels like with their new design. And then I'm also giving you a quick link to Energy Pro version 8 on Martin's website. Version 8 is the version that will be applicable to the 2019 code. And then the very last one is Handouts. If you click that button, it will open up a separate browser and automatically download a zip file that includes these handouts that we feel that are important for you to have as we go through our content today. The first two are from Energy Code ACE. They came out a couple of months ago, and it's a pretty in-depth, pretty beefy document about what's changing under um, that particular, uh, this particular code cycle. And Daryl's going to check Elizabeth and make sure our link is working right. Our next handout is something that Martin and I put together just for this class, this particular training, because we got so many people asking during registration for a very, very simple 
checklist or outline of the changes. So we gave you one that's intense, and you, we gave you one that's pretty uh, low-key and very simplistic. So the one that's from Energy Code ACE, I kind of wanted to walk through how it's laid out to help you understand basically how to use this document. First of all, they're in packets. So envelope is separated from mechanical, which is separated from lighting. So if all you ever do is envelope, you can take that one packet out of this handout, and you're good to go. You won't have to go through all 23 pages. Then I also I love table 100.0-A from the standards. I think that should be the table of contents for this code, because it walks through each building feature and where can you find the mandatory prescriptive performance and alternative methods available to additions and alterations all in one line item. Then we talk about where, uh, what mandatory requirements, including new definitions that might have been developed to support this new code language. And then it breaks down what's going on for prescriptive. So we start with mandatory. We always then go to prescriptive, what's going on, and then end up with what's specific to just additions and alterations for that particular building feature. Each of these sections is color-coded. So I do suggest not printing this in black and white to get the full effect of how this might be helpful. White means there's been no major changes or, in fact, no changes at all associated with that particular line item of code. Green means this language existed before, but it's been revised. So please pay attention to this revised language, because things are different than they were before. And purple stands for this is brand spanking new. You've never seen this before. You're probably going to want to spend some extra time understanding what is that new code language in addition to what's been altered. We are going to talk about just part six of Title 24. Title 24 has many parts to it, but we're really going to concentrate on part six, which is devoted to the energy code. And we have dates associated with when one code applies and the other. What is that all based on, Martin, and what do people need to be aware of? Well, the Energy Commission is saying, as they have done in the past, that the date, effective date of the code will be based upon your permit application date. And in this case, we will switch over to the 2019 code for any permits in which you apply on or after January 1st, 2020. So that means you've got till the end of this year to get your permit applications in under the 2016 code. Now, I strongly suggest that you check with your local enforcement agency to find out what their schedule looks like come December. What are their hours? When are they going to be open? When are they going to be accepting that? So they're going to have a cutoff date. So oh, sorry, the queue's full here. You know, we're not accepting any more applications after you know December 27th or something like that. So you really, really we're want feeling to make overwhelmed. Sure. We're going to have a longer Christmas break. See you next year. Yeah, well, I, I I know of one jurisdiction where you need to get your planning submittal in, and after you get your approval on your planning submittal, then you go in for per building permit application. And that jurisdiction has about a nine-month nine backlog right now on planning yeah. applications. So guess what? You're already under the 2019 code in that jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Many, many jurisdictions. Their planning department has a big backlog. Yeah. Martin and I are very concerned if people plan at and, and design under current code requirements and not being aware of how very quickly time passes. And December is going to be here before you know it. And that might then require a redesign of the project to be able to meet these new, more aggressive requirements under the Energy Code of next year. So where can you get your hands on the Energy Code itself? So I always recommend people read it at some point. I do know it does speak like uh, legalese, but it's very much worth reading. Here's a quick look at the new online resource center that we have available through the Energy Commission. And immediately they ask you, hey, what code year do you want? 2019 code, 2016 code, some other year. Let's go ahead and click what's going on for 2019. And the very first line item you have is here's where the standards, the manuals. You'll see right below that it has information about the compliance forms, what's going on with software. This is a great landing page to really find everything you need to be successful that you can get your hands on from the Energy Commission. 
But um, we get the, one of the number one forms uh, questions we get is where can I find the compliance forms? And there's places all over their website about where to find the forms. But while I'm here, I want to talk about the blueprint. The blueprint is a quarterly newsletter provided by the Energy Commission that has great, it, they answer like the most common questions they're getting through the hotline, uh, things that you need to be aware of that are being updated throughout a code cycle. And if you're not already subscribed to this blueprint email list, please take the time to go and sign up. Martin, um, are you signed up for the blueprint listserv? Are you kidding me? That's an essential part of that business. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if, if anybody on the phone is not signed up for the blueprint, honestly, you should do it. It's a non-intrusive, very informative newsletter. It's been a critical part of our business for many, many, many years. In fact, one of the first line items you see there, it has compiled blueprints. They even, each time they come out with one, they zip it up with all the others so that if you need to catch up, <laughs> or I love to keep this one and I like to do a search for certain keywords to get myself under, uh, into play. Uh, and this is also where you can find where uh, current certified software is available. And we'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of our presentation. Mandatory prescriptive performance. I'm hoping everyone has got this down. Mandatory measures apply to new construction, additions, alterations. If it is triggering code, you have to meet these mandatory requirements. We might have built on top of it prescriptive requirements. And the difference between mandatory and prescriptive is cost effectiveness. What might be found to be cost effective as a prescriptive measure, which is based on climate zone, might be based where it's only new homes versus additions and alterations to existing homes, might not meet that cost effectiveness of any time everywhere that a mandatory measure has to meet. Prescriptive um, requirements are also a method to show compliance. We can use the prescriptive approach to show compliance to our projects or use the performance approach using state certified software such as CBEC Res, Energy Pro, WriteSoft that enables us to trade prescriptive measures only to show compliance. Martin, um, I find that for at least for residential, I, be, I really use the performance approach 90% of the time. Prescriptive maybe only for like window change out or re-roof. What happens on your end? What do you do? Um, you know, it's one of these things, Gina, where my, my golden rule of thumb here is leave no stone unturned. So if I'm dealing with uh, new construction, it's always, always the performance approach. And I don't know anybody in the state that uses prescriptive for new construction. But when I'm dealing with uh, additions and alterations, I'll actually run it under both the prescriptive and the performance, see what the implications are, particularly if you're dealing with things like ADUs where you, you know, they're smaller units, uh, it is considered an addition, and they have a more relaxed approach to compliance uh, with that. So it doesn't hurt to check them both out and just give your client the, you know, the best choice that's going to work for them. Well, and that's the lovely thing about using Energy Pro is you can hit the button and it does both of them automatically for you. <laughs> <laughs> So climate zones, um, we have a, a, most of California is either what we call an extreme hot or cold climate zone. There's either a lot of air conditioning going on or a lot of heating going on. But we do have our mild uh, coastal climate zones. I live in one of those. I, I don't understand how you guys survive in any of these hot climate zones. I went out to uh, the valley over the weekend, and I, I went, no, no, can't live here. I love my climate zone three. Martin, you're in climate zone two? Technically, I live in climate zone two, but I am literally on the bay, and so I, I'm a climate zone three, even though the map says I'm two. Yeah. Climate zone three is lovely. We see nothing but fog this time of year. <laughs> EDR. I want to talk about how we're going to measure buildings differently. And especially for us energy consultants, it's a different way of thinking. So current code, we're used to saying how much better our buildings are in terms of a percentage. And just uh, you might not know, but that percentage that you're always saying, I am 20% better, well, that's based on TDV energy. Martin, what is TDV energy? What is that measurement? So the term was uh, developed back in the 2005 code cycle, and it stands for time-dependent valuation. 
And what we're basically doing is we're not only looking at how much energy you use, but at what particular hour of the day, time of the year it's used. So as an example, it would put a value on electricity that's used at, say, August 4 p.m. It would give it a much, much higher value than that same unit of electricity that's used at, say, January 2 a.m. So it's a way of uh, basically weighting the energy uses as to the importance uh, to, to the uh, grid itself. So we're transitioning to an EDR score for new homes and new low-rise multifamily buildings only. Additions and alterations are going to look and feel just like they always have. You're still going to get your form saying either results complies or results does not comply. But let's walk through some of what these other numbers are going to represent. So Martin, just what is an EDR score? So the EDR score represents the total energy usage of the building, not just the regulated uses. <clears throat> so that means it includes things like indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, appliances, et cetera, et cetera. And it was developed based upon the concept of a score of 100 is how much uh, would be consumed by a building that just met the 2006 IPCC code. The reason they use that as a reference is that's what the rest of the country uses for HERS ratings. So they decided, hey, how about California uses a scale that's similar to the rest of the country. A score of zero represents a, uh, a Z and E home, so a net energy home. Um, in the current code, you're probably going to be uh, scoring an EDR of about 50 or thereabouts. In the new code, you'll probably be scoring somewhere down in the in the mid to low 20s. So um, you can catch you can capture an EDR score in the current code. Uh, the software tools will print it out. The only time it's used in the current code, however, is for the city of Santa Monica's ZNE requirement. Um, no other jurisdiction I know of uses it. It is used for California Advanced Homes Program, but that's about all it's used for right now. So for all your new projects, new buildings you're doing now, you'll see an EDR score. And I recommend all of you take a look at your CF1R performs and look for that and start getting a feel of how the numbers go up or down. So Martin, I have a score of 20, and you have a score of 10. Which one is better than the other? Obviously, the closer we get to zero, the more energy efficient our home is. So the lower, the better. And um, as Martin stated, I know a lot of people got used to hearing 2020 is the Z and E code cycle. Well, we didn't quite get there. I like to call it as close to Z and E as we could cost effectively thinking about fuel switching code cycle. So zero is not our goal starting January of next year, but it's getting pretty close. As Martin said, it's, it's, it ranges. It depends upon your climate zone, but it'll be around between 15 and 30, depending upon where you are and what your building looks like. Now, we have two EDR scores. We have a building efficiency EDR score, and we have a PV plus flexibility EDR score. Martin, what's, how am I looking at these? How should I use these two EDR scores? You're going to have to comply with both scores, as we saw on that prior uh, page. The uh, CF1R gives us a comparison to both the both the efficiency score and the total EDR score. Now, the building efficiency score doesn't take into account any photovoltaics. So, as an example, if you decided, hey, uh, I want to put in a, an absolute ton of glass on my house, and I'm out in Palm Springs, and it's all going to be west facing, your building efficiency is going to go. Uh, to hell in a handbasket on something like that. You're going to have way too much energy usage on the cooling system, and it's going to show the building efficiency score fails. But you turn around and put in a ton of photovoltaic, and that makes your total score look pretty good. But too bad you failed on the building efficiency. So you have to comply with both components. This requires a reasonable balance of energy efficiency on the home, as well as a reasonable amount of photovoltaic production. So thinking about that, Martin, how should I read this EDR table? So what you want to look at here is you have the standard design, which is the energy budget. You have the proposed design. That's what you're proposing to build. You're contrasting their two scores. The first one is the efficiency EDR score, and the second one is the total EDR score. Both of those need to be in compliance. Fundamentally, the compliance margin on the far right 
needs to be zero or above in order to show that you are in compliance. But I'm still seeing a building energy use summary table. What do I use this for? Now this comes in handy because you can now break down and look at the individual components of energy usage. I can look at this table and say, hey, I'm doing really good on the heating. Uh, I'm doing okay on the cooling. Uh, I'm doing really well on the water heating, etc. And, and get a feel for which uh, building energy efficiency components are either helping you or hurting you. And that's a great diagnostic tool. Now I'm seeing a brand new table. Well, it's not brand new. If you did PV in this current code, you probably saw this PV table. But we want to really help you learn how to use this table and how it corresponds to your EDR rating table. So Martin, I see here that it says uh, 3 kWdc in terms of system size. But when then I look at the EDR table, it says standard design PV capacity 2.54 kW, and that PV kWh output exceeds the proposed electric use by 2.3%, which may violate, violate NEM rules. Contact your utility. Talk to me about the PV table versus what it's telling me in the EDR table, and what are, what are these NEM rules? So the PV table down below indicates what you are required to install. So that's your first focus. We need to put in a 3KW system. And if you guys don't know what 3KW is, um, you might want to do a little bit of homework on, on uh, PV solar systems. We have an online self-study at the uh, Energy Code ACE website. Go on there and brush up on some of the uh, concepts around solar systems and in particular photovoltaics. So we're looking at a 3KW system that we have to install. Now for information purposes, when we see the standard design PV capacity of 2.54, that's what the standard building, the budget building, would have in it. So what we're indicating here is we obviously have a slightly larger system than that. And then the other footnote there tells us that we are exceeding our proposed electric use by 2.3%. The NEM, net energy metering rules, are set by the local utilities. In most cases, they say to you, you cannot exceed your actual electric consumption by more than 5%. In other words, they don't want you putting in humongous PV systems and going into the power generation business. So that's an internal rule uh, related to the utilities, and it actually comes down from the, the California Public Utilities Commission. So if you're going to go down that route uh, of uh, excess production, I suggest you check with them to make sure you're not violating those rules. So all of us are really going to be needing to be looking at these bullet points that are associated with the EDR table and seeing what it's telling us about what is your standard des uh, design side in terms of PV and when you might have to talk to your client about what has to happen if you're exceeding them. We want to make sure you're aware of the fact that this performance form is going through a lot of growth right now. <laughs> so it's cleaning up, it's streamlining, they're adding some things. And I got to tell you, me printing this form and five times in the last five days, things look different every single time. So it is evolving. Don't get stuck on something having to look a certain way. Um, Go with the flow. Be aware. It's changing. But Martin, we feel that's going to settle by October. What's happening in October we all should be aware of? Well, the Energy Commission is planning on putting out some, uh, some service packs on the software and that type of thing. And they are hoping to get finalized all of the compliance forms. So we're hopeful that all of this stuff will settle down by then. But let's face it, um, they, they continue to, to make improvements to the forms. And as long as the imp improvements are in the, in the right direction and they're making the forms easier to read, et cetera, et cetera, then I'm all for it. It makes it very difficult for us to teach classes on them because we have to show you a <laughs> perf one. But just keep in mind that what we show you on screen may look a little different once the, uh, the, the final versions have come out. What's also happening in October is when the HERS Raider registries are on the docket to be approved. So we're not even going to have the ability to have registered CF1R documentation until that time. So do be aware there are things that still need to kind of be put in place for us to be successful getting documentation to submit for compliance for the next code cycle. 
So this is the bulk of our decoding talk. We break things down into four challenges, and we did it by building feature. So challenge A is going to be about envelope, the mechanical, our little teeny challenge about lighting, and then we're going to wrap things up with how things look for PV plus flexibility. We'll even tell you what that flexibility stands for when we get to that particular challenge. But let's talk first about the changes we're seeing for the envelope. One thing to be aware of is we have a new table. So I don't know about you, Martin, but you know, I remember it was package A, package B, C, then D, then E. Then they decided not to go to F, and they started back all over again with package A. And I thought it was interesting this time that they got rid of the letters, and they just said component package. <laughs> no more renumbering, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's more consistent with the way they do the, uh, the non-res uh, tables because those have always just been referred to as you know the component package or whatever. So I think it's so. This is going to look really familiar to what we have in current code. It actually doesn't look much different at all. What's different is we have one table for single family, and here we have it where it's indicating to us, hey, this is table one fifty point one a. And then we have a different table, sorry, double-clicking happening here, for multifamily. So if you're looking to see what the requirements are prescriptively for a low-rise multifamily building, that's a building that's three habitable stories or less with more than two dwelling units, that would be a duplex, that's the single-family table. Here's our multifamily table. Um, things do look different. Cost effectiveness and the requirements that apply to this next code cycle are going to little, look a little bit different, single family versus multifamily. We're going to start at the top of the building and work our way down and start talking about what's happening with attics. One thing I want to make sure I'm stressing is high performance attic is dependent upon climate zone. So these requirements will apply to our hotter, more extreme climate zones, climate zones four, and 8 through 16 is where these high-performance addicts are prescriptively required. I have to tell you, I'm in climate zone 3, and sometimes I find it's more cost-effective to do a high-performance attic in climate zone 3, even though it's not required, and use that as a performance credit to offset something else I might find I don't want to do, such as rigid insulation on the walls. So just because we're saying prescriptively it only applies to these climate zones, you still might want to pay attention to thinking about how these work, even if you're not in those climate zones. We have three options. Option A, where there's insulation at the ceiling, I have a vented attic, and then I have insulation above the roof deck, but below the roofing. roofing. Option B, insulation at the ceiling, vented attic, insulation below the roof deck. And then option C is I have insulation on the ceiling, it's a vented attic, but because my ducts are in the directly conditioned space, I don't have to concern myself about additional insulation at the roof. For this next code cycle, option A is going away as a prescriptive choice. I don't know why it's doing this. It's driving me crazy. Um, we no longer have option A as a prescriptive choice. We still have option B and C. But Martin, I'd really like you to con tell them Wow, they so seriously need to be thinking about this whole roofing with airspace and what that means. Sure. So the prescriptive requirement uh, indicates that we need insulation below the roof deck. But in addition, uh, we need an actual airspace installed above the roof deck below the roofing itself. So in this picture here, you'll see that we have a, a tile roof, and that is set on uh, actual bat and that raises the tile up off the roof. That airspace contributes to the performance of the roof. Now, under option B, if you chose to go that route and you wanted to do prescriptive compliance, you would not be able to use a comp shingle roof because the comp shingles are going to be fastened directly down onto the roof deck. You're not going to get an airspace. So in that case, your only choice with a comp shingle roof would be to go with the performance modeling. And of course, the performance modeling will allow you to specify whether you have a comp shingle roof or a tile uh, roof. And I do find that the airspace in the performance modeling actually gives it a, a nice little boost in terms of uh, Title 24 compliance. So when I use the performance approach and I'm modeling a high performance attic and I'm using comp roof without an airspace, am I compared to a high performance attic with an airspace associated to the roofing? 
I believe that the standard building has a airspace with the tile roof. Yes, mm -hmm. that is correct. Yes. So I just fact, want to make yes. sure people are aware of the fact yeah. Yeah. you are going to take a penalty in your performance calculation to go to comp roof. And yeah. it means there's something else you're going to do to offset that penalty. Let's talk about the insulation requirements associated with your ceiling insulation. There have been no changes regarding that R30 or R38, depending upon your climate zone. But we are seeing changes for that insulation below the roof deck. Uh, current code, uh, most people were looking at an R13 uh, because of that. It was associated with the roofing with an air space associated with the roofing material. And Martin, it's going up to R19. That's a pretty big jump, isn't it? Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you'll have to think about how that uh, insulation is going to be put up there because we're talking about, in the case of R19, a six-inch uh, six inch bat. So maybe that's going to be uh, another push towards using a spray foam application up there. Uh, maybe you're going to use a, uh, you know, a blown-in application where you've got a netting system, etc. So there's a number of choices in the industry for how you do that particular detail. With it getting more stringent, that does mean it's more difficult to trade it away in a performance calculation. I do know there's a lot of you out there in this particular group that have contractors that really don't want to do a high-performance attic. It's going to be a lot more difficult to trade it away in the next code cycle. Things do look a little bit differently for multifamily. You'll see that there's a couple of climate zones that they are not R19, it's R13. These are climate zones in which they weren't able to show it was cost effective to require the R19, hence it's staying at the R13 for climate zones 10 and climate zone 16. Let's talk about walls. We have a new mandatory minimum in town, Martin. I, I don't remember the last time they changed. Well, I, I do. I do actually do remember when the mandatory minimum was R11. I am that yeah, old. Well, but but yeah, uh, it's been a while since we... <laughs> you dating yourself. I was thinking of the, the latest one when we went to the, the two by six uh, had to fill the cavity <laughs> rule. <laughs> <laughs> I went back even further. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's, what's the R20? I have to tell you, I've never seen a bad insulation called R20. Well, if you're going to do bad insulation in this application, you're probably going to use R21. R21 is a special high-density bat. It's designed to fit into a uh, five and a half inch cavity. The problem with R19 is that it's six inch bat and it gets compressed into the cavity. So you don't really get the full R19. You get more like about 17.8. So the commission's setting this requirement at R20. So that means for people using bat insulation, you can use R21. But you also have the option there that you could potentially use a blown in system. And blown in systems, it might give you an R20. Just depends on the particular product you're blowing into the into the uh, cavity space. Yeah, they were keeping the door open, allowing you to go with blown-in insulation, and also then the option to go in with that, which would be your R21. So prescriptively, now remember this is layered on top of your mandatory requirements. You can trade away in a performance down to your mandatory minimums. What I got to say out loud is going to be close to impossible. But let's talk about our prescriptive requirements. Climate zone 6 and 7, well, it's just so mild there. They haven't made changes to that prescriptive requirement in a while, and it's going to stay exactly as is. But all our other climate zones, climate zones 1 through 5 and 8 through 16, Martin, what's going on there? Okay, so what they're asking us for there is a better wall, basically a U factor being reduced down to 0 0.048. Uh, one example of achieving that would be to build a 2 by 6 wall, put the high-density R21 into the cavity, and the usual R5, one inch of extruded polystyrene, continuous insulation on the exterior. Now, there's another example of an option where if you go want, to, want to go with a 2x4 wall, which some builders, they, they absolutely want 2x4 walls. Okay, That's fine. You go with a 2x4 wall, you put the R15 in there, and you put the additional 2-inch R10 insulation continuous on the outside. The only thing I'll say about that one is you do need to think about the implications of attaching the uh, finished material for the building uh, through that two inches of insulation into your uh, into your um, your sheathing, and how those fossils are going to you know penetrate that insulation, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, we do sure. have a resource or a couple of resources available on how you can do these high performance walls that we're describing here. Um, one of those is to take a look at the California Advanced Homes Program website and they've got the master builder materials there. So you should be able to uh, Google uh, CAHP and the term master builder and there's a great resource there. The other one console has out which is called Wise Warehouse. You can Google that one as well and you'll find particular materials and, and uh, products there. I have to say shout out to the CAP program. They also have a modeling guide book for those uh, energy modelers out there that help you learn how to use either Energy Pro or CBEC Res in modeling high performance attics and walls and uh, other wall types such as staggered wall that can be a little um, challenging if you've never done them before. For those architects and designers out there, there's such an excellent class that's available at all the utilities that's all about how to detail to a high performance enclosure. And it's just one of the best classes I've ever attended. And at the end of the day, you know how to, you're going to have a whole library of details on how to detail high performance attics and walls with discontinuous insulation. For multifamily buildings, they did not change the wall U factor from the 0.051. That remained the same. This new 0.048, more the lower U factor, more energy efficient U factor, is just associated with single family, not including climate zone 6 and 7. Mass walls above grade. There was a little shift in how we looked at the language here. So um, current code says, nothing really <laughs> about above grade mass walls, basically implying code by emission that there are no requirements for these mass walls. Now it says go look to the prescriptive requirements in section 150.1. Martin, what is 150.1 telling us about the insulation requirements for mass walls above grade? Well, there's two places you can install the insulation, uh, either on the interior or the exterior. So if you're going to install it on the interior in climate zones 1 through 15, uh, they're looking at a 0.077 U factor. That basically equates to R13 continuous insulation. I doubt you're going to go that route. My guess is you're going to fur it out with 2x6s and put R21 insulation. That'll give you the equivalency of about an R14 continuous. So you're looking at substantial framing uh, on the inside of that mass wall. Uh, examples of these might be CMU walls, they might be something like a, uh, a rammed earth wall, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a substantial requirement. If you decide to insulate it on the exterior, uh, you'll see that they're calling for what basically equates to R8 continuous insulation. Once again, that could be a substantial amount of insulation. Uh, if you're using something like an EPS, expanded polystyrene product, then you're looking at two inches of product there to, to achieve that. So in both cases, it's a, it's a substantial requirement that they're asking for. And being aware that this is a mandatory requirement, this applies to additions, alterations, demising walls, any place we see these walls, um, if they are separating conditioned from unconditioned or conditioned to the great outdoors, we'll have to meet these requirements without the ability to trade it away in the performance approach. We see that the U factor and the solar heat gain coefficient, when the solar heat gain coefficient applies, is being lowered a bit. Um, both Martin and I aren't thinking this is going to be a big shock to the industry. A lot of this product is available. If you were using metal framing, well, it's going to be even harder to get that to work. What do you think the impact is of Climate Zone 16 now not having to meet the SHGC requirement, Martin? Well, I think a lot of people are happy for this change because for many years, Climate Zone 16 was considered a heating climate. Examples would include something like Tahoe, uh, something like uh, Mammoth Lakes, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's switching back to becoming what we basically consider to be a heating climate, which means we are encouraging in the code the use of high SHGC window products to allow a lot of beneficial solar gain into the home to provide passive heating in the wintertime. So this does mean when we are at, in these climate zones, the lower the SHGC is not the better. It's actually the worst. So
So we really need to make sure that our um, energy calculations reflect the appropriate U factor and SHGC of what we're going to see out on site and uh, plans examiners, building inspectors who might be attending. If those products are lower, that might not mean better. We want them to match, and that's something that's it's, it's very subtle when we start looking at this stuff when we try to tell people when not to worry about things. And we've never really had to worry about opaque doors before, Martin, but now we have a new requirement for NFRC-rated solid doors with a U-factor of 0.2. What does that mean, and how do I even find a door that meets these requirements? Well, basically, we're talking about an insulated door with a core of some type of foam insulation. Um, that right away probably limits our choices significantly. Uh, I'm looking at the door here, and I'm guessing this is a solid wood door. So that's not going to meet that requirement. Uh, a bigger concern to me is what do I actually know about the door, in particular the front door to the home. Uh, an architect gives me a set of plans, and they show a door. What's the door going to be? We don't know. The homeowner is going to go pick that out and find their absolute favorite door because that's the first thing somebody sees when they get to the home, and it's a very important choice to them. So we're going to stay out of that. It's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to put in my Title 24 calculations then because if I require them to put an R5 NFRC rated door, they're going to have a very limited subset of doors available from that vendor that meet that certification. So it's going to require you as an energy consultant uh, to think about how you're going to do those calculations and how you're going to deal with those doors. And don't forget the other change here, which is going to affect us, is that any doors that have 25% or more glass in them are now treated as a window. So this door here is right on the borderline, but a little bit more glass in this door, and we have to treat the entire thing as a window. Now. Uh, we treat the entire thing as a window. That's great. We don't know what they're going to put in for that door. So that, quote, window now has to use the table 110.6 defaults. And those 110.6 defaults means you're going to get a fairly good penalty on that particular door, depending on which way it faces. I have to tell you, Brian Selby, who we do a lot of this work with, he actually measured how much glass was in this door, and we're at 17.7%. So imagine a little bit more doesn't it? Not much more gets us over that 25% um, designation to which then now I have to take the complete rough opening of this door and treat it like a glass French door. And uh, I have to tell you, when it comes to the solid door, and you know what, Gina, I am totally going to not do anything about that NFRC point to you factor. I'm going to use the default at 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is what represents default. I've seen it make a difference in those TD and the um, EDR scores by one to one and a half EDR points. And that can be the difference between passing and not passing. So there's things to be thinking about as more conversations we have to have with our clients. So let's talk about what HERS measures are associated with our envelope. We have quality insulation installation, QII, that's been a performance extra credit item that very few people have been taking advantage of. Building envelope sealing, HERS verified existing conditions, having a HERS rater confirm what the R value is for spray insulation. These are all extra credit. But we've seen a shift, and the shift is, is that QII is now prescriptively required for all new homes and additions exceeding 700 square feet. Martin, what concerns us about this? Well, one of the things is that QII is not necessarily something most of us have been using on projects. And I did mention the instances where QII was specified but never followed by the contractor. So I think it's going to behoove us to either use QII in order to get our buildings to comply, or we need to put in other efficiency measures that will offset the need for QII. And you'll need to weigh what is the expense of doing those other efficiency measures versus the expense of doing QII. And in the test projects I've done, I've played with the software a lot because I just love playing with software. I find it really varies. It varies based on what is the what are the walls and the roof to begin with. If it's all high performance walls and adequate, well, it's it's not that big of a deal honestly to get rid of the QII. 
But here's an example where I, I have a client like, no, Gina, I'll do everything else you're telling me, but I am not going to do that high performance wall with the rigid insulation. Current code, they're taking about a 10.7% TDV hit because of that. The minute I click that button saying, yeah, we're going to do QII for this project, I'm now in compliance. There's an 11.5 TDV shift. In the next code cycle, same exact building, but with PV, here's what Martin and I were talking about. This building is now 20% out of compliance. And I'm used to maybe having that one magic bullet being that QII button. I press the button, I still have an 11% you know, TDV compliance margin shift, but I'm still not in compliance by 8.4%. 8 8 That's about uh, four, T, uh, 4 EDR points. And even in a mild climate zone, it's even a little bit more dramatic because insulation has that much more to do in a heating environment than it would in a cooling environment. So for me, this is a pretty big deal depending upon the project, depending upon the scope of work, and whether my clients truly are prepared for what a QII project means. QII, that HERS rater has to be out there really, really early. And Martin, why are we encouraging the HERS rater to be there during a re to be able to review the design before it really even goes in for permit? Well, the HERS rater is obviously the person that's going to do the inspection. So that's the person that the builder needs to satisfy. The building inspector is probably not going to plan review the um, the insulation installation to the level of, of um, preciseness that the HERS rater will. So they need to explain to them what the process is, when the inspections need to be done, what needs to be done at each stage. You've got an air barrier you need to deal with. You've got your insulation behind, behind the bathtubs and things like that that you need to deal with. You've got um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the air barriers, uh, air sealing, all that stuff. And so having that HERS rater come in there and explain that to the builder and explain, hey, do not put your drywall up so that I can do the inspections on the insulation and then you can feel free to drywall. Things like that to make sure the process goes smoothly. And HERS raters I've talked to have all said the best thing you can ever do is have me meet with the builder at the job site and talk about this early on in the project. There's also requirements such as insulated headers and certain issues regarding that air barrier that we're talking about with walls, that getting them involved early, making sure the details on the plan set speak well to these requirements so that the contractor can be successful, is how this is going to work. Here's a slide that lists every single person that's going to be affected by some aspect behind the QII process. The energy consultant's fully educating the client on what QII means. The designer being able to update their plans and really incorporate QII well into how that contractor is going to be building that project. Plans examiner making sure it's big and bold. And I have some building departments that have this big QII red stamp that they stamp every single drawing in the set the minute they see QII because they have seen it be missed so many times out in the field. That installer being aware of the requirements and being able to work with the HERS rater and engaging the HERS rater early. So many of our HERS measures now are all about HVAC equipment, and that's towards the end of a project. Mar Martin, I, brought, I got my HERS rater out when he went to go verify my duct testing. Oh, and there's also QI, QII on there. What am I going to do? Yeah, well, that's the problem is at that stage, you're probably going to bring it back to the Title 24 consultant, and they're going to say, hey, you know, we're now out by 10 15%. How about we put triple pane windows in? Huh, the window's already in. Um, how about we put in a high-efficiency air conditioner, a high-efficiency furnace, and a high-efficiency water heater? Stuff's already in. So we're running out of things to mm -hmm. do. Probably the most likely thing we can do at that stage is to put in one of those battery systems. You guys have probably heard of them on the news. You know, Tesla Powerwalls, one of the more ones that's kicked around and whatnot. But, boy, somebody just made a $15,000 mistake, didn't they? Because that's what it's going to cost at that stage to throw one of those systems into the home and had the builder done the QII, then they would have saved that expense. And besides the fact, having a building that has the insulation installed that much better 
I don't know if I'll ever be able to build my own home, Martin, but if I do, I'm sorry, I want to see every single wall before they do anything with it. <laughs> I want to see before it's covered up. You uh, built your own house. Did you make sure you got pictures and everything? Oh, no, make sure I got pictures. I had the Hertz Raider out and inspected it. And boy, this guy's, mm -hmm. this guy's a tough, tough inspector. You know, he went everything, everything with a fine tooth comb. So. so you were looking for that tough HERS Raider to make sure everything was done right. So again, we want to be able to emphasize this is not just for new homes. This is for additions that exceed 700 square feet, of which QII will now be prescriptively required. You can still try and trade it away in a performance calculation, but it can be a big ticket item to try and trade away. Additions that are less than 700 square feet, uh, 700 square feet or less, we do not have QII requirements. We also have some leniency in how we look at the attic, but we do have some changes going on there also, Martin, don't we? Yeah, so in the, if the addition is less than 700, 700 square feet or less, in the current code, you can actually get by here prescriptively with R22. And that was one of the reasons, Gina, I mentioned earlier, sometimes we do look at additions prescriptively just for that R22 instance. But with the new code, it's not mm -hmm. going to be quite as useful because we're going to be asking for between R30 and R38 installation, installation in that instance, uh, depending on which climate zone you're in. <clears throat> I find most people are doing those installation values anyway, but it's something that we have to talk about. And now let's talk about extended walls, because we have a new installation requirement for extended walls associated with additions also. So Take in the away, Martin. <laughs> yep. in, the, in the current code, uh, two by six wall extensions are allowed to have, have R19 insulation. In the new code, they're bumping that up to R21. Now, I don't see that as that big of an issue. R21 is very commonplace out in the industry these days. It's, it's very, very common. And with the new code, with R19 basically getting kicked to the curb uh, by mandatory measures, um, I think you're just going to see R21 become a, a commonly stocked item in the state of California. Uh, Martin, I went out there and my contractor put R19 in all the walls. Can I go back and use the performance approach and take a penalty for them not using R21? It's a mandatory measure. So a lot of people ask this question, even to this day, Gina, can I run the performance mm -hmm. approach and get my way out of a mandatory measure? No, you cannot. Okay? It's mandatory for a reason, and as I like to say, you can't count your way out of a mandatory measure. So that will mean you really need to start getting the word out to all the contractors. I don't want to see any R19 of my projects anymore <laughs> because it's going to cause problems starting next year. Let's do a check your understanding now that we've really gone through an envelope well with you guys. I'm hoping you're all going to have this under your belts. I have some questions for you. Which of these options are allowed prescriptively for a high-performance attic in the 2019 code cycle? Which of these high-performance attic requirements must be used for a roof that has no airspace below the roofing material? Which compliance method are you going to use if you do not have an airspace associated with your roofing material? And when is QII a prescriptive requirement for the 2019 code cycle? Martin, it looks like we've got almost everyone answering our first question saying option B and option C is what's going to be allowed prescriptively in the 2019 code. Is that correct? Yeah, option A has been eliminated as a prescriptive option, and that's the above deck roof insulation option. However, it is still permitted under the performance modeling approach. And if I don't have an airspace associated with my roofing material, which method am I going to use? Prescriptive, performance, can I use both? You have to use the, the performance approach in this case because prescriptively, as shown in that diagram there, we expect the airspace. And when is QII required? A new home, an addition over 700 square feet, an addition 700 square feet or less, or an alteration? Which one of these is going to require QII prescriptively? So we would have to do the, uh, the new home uh, as... Um, 
as uh, to QII standards, we'd also need to do the additions that are over 700 square feet. We don't have the option of doing QII for alterations, and I don't even, I don't know how it works then with those at smaller additions either, if it's even something you can do as an extra credit item. I know you can't for alterations. You, uh, you, you guys have got this down. You can for additions under 700 square feet, under the performance approach. Okay. You could, you could take credit for that, yes. There we go. So if we've got our contractors where they just have got it, we're doing good. Maybe you might have that in your back pocket as a tool for those smaller additions. Let's go back to our presentation and start talking about mechanical because there are some big changes going on for mechanical too. Now, it might not be affecting um, us energy consultants and even maybe some of our designers, architects and designers so much, but it's definitely going to affect our contractors, building inspectors, and HERS raters. One of the things that's going on is there's a brand new MERV filter in town. M Martin, what's going on with MERV filters and um, how it's being applied to more than just one building type? Okay, so it is a mandatory measure and it uh, does apply to all of your low-rise residential applications. That would be, include single family, any number of stories, multi-family, three stories or less. Now you don't necessarily need to memorize that rule because it's also going to apply to your commercial applications and to your high-rise residential, as we talked about this morning. The MERV 13 filter basically is a higher level of filtration. It pulls more junk out of the air. Uh, because it does that, it tends to have more static pressure restriction on the system. So to alleviate that, the Energy Commission is asking for a minimum 2-inch filter depth. That's to increase the amount of, fil uh, of, of actual pleat area on the filter and to reduce that, uh, that amount of static pressure on the system. Now, technically speaking, if you want to stick to a one-inch filter, you could do that, but the, you're going to have to size the filter up much, 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 much bigger. Uh, this would apply to new construction projects. It would apply if you're doing a complete system change out, including the ductwork. It is not required, however, if you're using things like mini splits, et cetera, as long as you have 10 feet or less of ductwork. We have a new requirement for HERS testing for when we have any of these components in the garage, ducts, air handler, cooling coils. I've never seen a cooling coil in the garage, but I've definitely seen a lot of air handlers. I've definitely seen plenums and ducts. Why are these HERS duct testing requirements so much more stringent for systems that have any of this in the garage, Martin? Well, the fact of the matter is you're probably pulling uh, some of the air, if you've got leaky ducts, some of the air into the system and bringing that into the home. Now, the, the concern about that coming out of a garage is an indoor air quality problem. You're introducing chemicals. Maybe you're storing gasoline out there. Maybe you're storing fertilizer out there cleaning chemicals, you've got the carbon monoxide from your car when it's, when it's running, and that type of thing. So for that reason, we don't want that stuff coming into the home. We want the ducts sealed down to a 6% leakage level. So these are really not going to affect how we go about doing things in terms of design, etc. What concerns me is that when a HERS reader goes out and tests these systems and it fails, how is that contractor going to be able to recover from a fail? When it comes to the duct testing, there is that smoke test that can only be done by the HERS rater to make sure that all accessible ducts have been done and that they've done the best they could. But when it comes to the MERV 13 filter, uh, such as Martin was saying, we have more static pressure on the system. And if those ducts are already not, I don't even know if I want to use the word designed well, they're put installed the way they've always done it, and there's already a lot of static pressure on the system because there's a lot of bends. There's a lot more duct work than we need. Being able to test out and meet the fan walk draw requirements that that HERS rater is also going to be doing is going to be extremely difficult and may even close to impossible depending upon how they're going to recover from that. So this is the concern I have in terms of that testing out in the field. While we're talking about indoor air quality, let's talk about how big those fans need to be. And this is how this designers, energy consultants do need, do need to be aware of this. How are we talking to people about what is going to be your indoor air quality system and how does it need to be sized? What are the changes that we're seeing, Martin? Well, 
in the current calculations that we do for single family IAQ fans, the formula is 0 0.01. And then you'll see here the formula is being changed to 0 0.03. That actually aligns itself with the equations that we are currently using for multifamily. So single family and multifamily will now use that equation 0 0.03 times the floor area plus seven and a half times number of bedrooms plus one. As you can see uh, in the example below, that bumps our ventilation rate from 50 CFM up to about 90. So more or less uh, doubles the ventilation. Now, does that present too much of a problem? Probably not because on a three bedroom home, I would expect you'd probably have at least two bathrooms. So if you're putting in a 50 CFM fan in each bathroom, then you're going to get your 100 CFM. So I think you'll probably be okay there. Just a matter of knowing that you have this higher ventilation rate. Uh, important, however, is the rule listed on the left side of the screen there. And that is any time you're adding an accessory dwelling unit onto a home, even though we treat that as an addition, because we're adding an ADU there, it is required to have its own IAQ fan meeting the same formula. To me, that was something that just totally made sense. I didn't like the fact that there was a way out of providing an indoor air quality system to a new AD unit just because we're calling it an addition. So for me, I'm like, yeah, you know, they deserve their own very special indoor air quality fan. And while we're talking about indoor air quality, there's even more. This is a big indoor air quality uh, boost to this particular 2019 code cycle. There's some new stuff coming into town regarding range hoods that all of us need to be aware of design all the way to out in the field in terms of verification. What's going on with kitchen hoods? OK, so uh, they are required to be inspected by a HERS rater. It is a visual inspection. It is not a test. And they will verify by referencing the HVI uh, directory, Heating Ventilating Institute, that that product has been certified to show at least 100 CFM and no more than three zones on the sound rating. Now, the interesting part about this is it's a mandatory measure. So you guys are going to be doing this for your new construction projects, obviously. You're going to be doing this for ADUs because they're going to have kitchens in those ADUs. But you're also going to be doing this for any additions that might involve a new kitchen hood or, believe it or not, if you're doing an alteration to a home and you're remodeling your kitchen and that involves a new kitchen hood, that also requires HERS verification. So we're, we're not too concerned um, if people aren't too... Um, a, attached to a very particular look or style of a, of a hood, but Martin and I do have some concerns when people want to put together a custom hood in terms of a certain look. Is that something that can be HVI certified, and what is that certification process going to look like when that HERS rater goes out there and they're like, I can't find this in the system? Well, the only way that that project is going to pass is if that hood gets replaced with something that is in the system or potentially working with the manufacturer, I guess, Martin, and seeing how quickly they could get their product in the HVI directory? Well, if it's something like a custom hood, you know, I mean, people build custom hoods all the time, you know, custom copper hood. You know, people probably spend sixty or $100,000 on hoods in places I can't afford to live. Um, <laughs> but, but what's important is they need to use components in there, the fan components and that type of thing that do have the HVI certification and make sure those plug into whatever custom hood they build so that that can be verified. So, um, and I think that's an important thing to say. We're not, when we say kitchen hoods, it might not be that whole, you know, stainless steel beast we're talking about there, but the components, the fan systems that are integrated into these kitchen hoods that need to meet that certification. And this is a slide, this is another issue, where, place where I have some concerns. And this is regarding that fan watt draw testing that has to happen by the HERS rater for a brand new system or a complete replacement, including ducting, indoor and outdoor units, and is associated with systems in which there's air conditioning. If I don't have air conditioning, I don't have to worry about this. Martin, what are these new requirements, and how are they going to affect that testing that happens out in the field? Well, there's two concerns here. Uh, in the case of the furnace system, um, the, or the furnace with cooling system, 
they are, number one, dropping the requirement uh, from 0.58 watts per CFM down to 0.45 watts per CFM. But the second whammy on this one is the fact that it has to be tested with the MERV-13 filter installed. So that's going to put additional mm -hmm. static pressure on the system. So now we're asking for a lower CFM with a higher static pressure filter. So it's important that the HVAC contractor design and implement the installation of the system so that they don't have the restrictions on the supply ducts. They don't have the restrictions on the return ducts. They use an air handler that's going to have an ECM motor here, not just your run-of-the-mill air handler, so that we're able to achieve this rating. Now, it doesn't apply um, as far as the watts per CFM value, to heat pumps and other fan coils, but those still would have to be tested with the same uh, MERV-13 filter to the same level as we're asking for today. The back door we have to this is that people can use the prescriptive approach on how they're doing their, um, I guess, their fan efficacy of the system, and that's using a table that has, this is the size of your return grills, this is your prescriptive option, that's uh, a way around uh, the HERS verification. Martin, describe what does a return grill look like that meets these prescriptive table requirements? Um, if you're going to do prescriptive, you're looking at a substantial amount of ductwork, depending upon the size of the system. Uh, in some instances, you could be looking at as much as uh, two 20 to 24 inch return ducts. So that ends up being a fairly substantial uh, set of grills. Um, and you know, most people are used to most HVAC systems probably having one return duct on them. So this is something the contractor might have to then uh, take care of in the field to accommodate the, the much larger return area. So something this is, I, I, I'm, Martin wasn't as concerned about this as I was, but I am concerned about this being successful out in the field with that HERS rater. I've heard some stories of just the contractor being so frustrated about constantly failing the fan watt draw testing requirements and then them being so much more stringent with that MERV-13 filter. I have concerns. Small duct high velocity forced air systems, they are not common, but I'm seeing more and more projects starting to use them. What's interesting here is they became, the testing requirements for these systems became more lenient, became a little bit more applicable to the, how these uh, systems function. So that's something that's nice to see that we're seeing code that allows these systems to be testing out in a way that's possible. Water heating. There have been some big changes happening for water heating that has people applauding all over the place. One of the changes is if you were to, by chance, if you want to use a gas tankless system, um, you can use as many as you want. Uh, current code kind of limits you to one. You have to use the performance approach if you want to use more than that. Basically, they're saying, hey, let's do some compact hot water design and have that water heater be near where all the uses are. And if you have to put in another water heater, so be it um, to have that closer to those other uses within the building. If you want to use a large tank gas water heater, well then there's even more hoops you have to jump through to potentially offset the energy penalty associated with those systems. So what you're seeing here is a prescriptive pathway, which we don't think anyone would use this prescriptive pathway, but we want to be able to emphasize the fact that using anything over uh, 55 gallons or um, over that 75,000 BTUH is going to trigger the need to jump through some additional hoops to be able to show compliance for those systems. Or, and this is what has a lot of people excited, what are people so excited about, Martin? With the 2019 code cycle, the California Energy Commission is giving us two performance pathways to compliance, and for that matter, prescriptive. Um, the, the performance pathway is the one that obviously has us all excited. So in the current code, the pathway to compliance assumes that the standard water heater is a gas tankless water heater. In the new code, if you choose to go with a all electric home, then your standard budget building will be an all electric home. If you choose to do a mixed fuel home with gas furnace, gas water heater, then the budget will be based upon the same thing, a gas water heater, gas furnace. So what's great about this is for those that do want to shift over to 
functionality where they are not using uh, fossil fuels in the home, you have this ability to achieve compliance. What's important to understand though on the water heater is we're using something like I'm describing here in this picture which is what's called a heat pump water heater. If you don't have any experience with heat pump water heaters, you might want to do a little online Googling and get a little understanding of this stuff. Um, it's basically a heat pump that sits on top of a tank of hot water and the heat pump chugs away and it produces heat and heats up the tank. And quite frankly, I installed one about a year and a half ago and I'm super happy with it. I was able to to replace a propane water heater with that and my solar PV system feeds to the water heater so uh, I re reduce that much of my fossil fuels. We still are having a lot of people ask us, Gina, I want to use an electric resistance water heater and I have to go, oh, that is still very much frowned upon and in a performance calculation you will be taking a big penalty for electric resistance water heating. What will be totally encouraged with absolutely no penalty is a heat pump water heater, specifically a, a heat pump NIA 3 uh, tier water heater is what they're looking for. That's, that's pretty standard in the industry. And let's talk a little bit of what's happening with uh, water heater changeouts. Even here, there is now a heat pump option that if you want to get rid of your gas and you want to change out your gas water heater to a heat pump water heater, Excellent. Go for it. We'd like to see a NIA Tier 3 heat pump water heater. We walk away and call it done. We don't care anymore if there's gas near the water heater or if you have gas to the home. Go for it. Just put in the appropriate type of electric water heater, that not being electric resistance. You can go ahead and do electric resistance if you're replacing an electric resistance water heater as long as it does not exceed 60 gallons and there's absolutely no natural gas near that water heater. Multifamily specific. So um, can I have a raise of hands? I don't know how ma if you guys know how to raise your hands. In the upper left hand corner, there's a little figure of a guy with his hand raised. If you can raise your hand if you do multifamily building. Does anyone here uh, in the room do multifamily design? Okay. Because what we're about to talk about right now is specific to multifamily. This does not apply to single family. And this does not apply to the common areas associated with multifamily buildings. So Martin, we have three different methods that people go about providing ventilation to the dwelling units. Walk us through these three methods and our opinions about these methods. Mm -hmm. I'm always, always happy to give an opinion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exhaust only, opinions exhaust are only. free. <laughs> exhaust only ventilation is the most common one that's done these days. Uh, most people put an exhaust fan in the, in the bathroom in the dwelling and they'll call that their uh, AQ fan. So it, it's obviously not the greatest solution since you're, you're pulling stuff from all over the place. Um, somewhat less common, uh, a supply-only ventilation system. Uh, keep in mind, this is better because you do get the ability uh, to filter the supply air. In fact, not only the ability, but you're mandated to put filters, more filters on that. Um, but probably the best option is the balanced ventilation system. And we're going to show you a slide in a minute that's going to back up that statement that that's really the way you want to go. But one of the <laughs> things I like about the balanced ventilation system is you have the option under the performance approach to also include what's called an ERV, energy recovery ventilation device, or HRV, heat recovery ventilation device, as part of that so that you can do energy recovery. And I like that because this gives me options with the multifamily projects to actually get extra energy efficiency in there. So that's that's why we consider that. Now, Martin, easy. is that balanced ventilation with an ERV and HRV available for single-family homes? It is actually, and it's actually a fairly nice compliance credit. I've done it on a couple of projects a, recently. We did a fire station nice. the other day. Yeah, <laughs> we did a fire station. And the, the engineer, the mechanical engineer, caught us on it. He said, this is not a good solution here. I said, well, it's bringing the building into compliance. He goes, we'll find something else. So I said, sure, we can put a photovoltaic system on. It's going to cost the client $12,000 to put that system on there. Do you really want to not put the balanced ventilation system on there? So I, I found it to be a very economical solution um, in that instance, and I've used it on, on a number of other projects. 
So, um, there's some great systems out there. Even those who are doing single-family homes, there's a great Panasonic system. It's all about how their efficiency rating. The higher the efficiency rating, the more expensive they are. But I have used them more and more often on projects these days, single family, ADUs, and multifamily. It's one of those extra credit in the back of my pocket things that I can bring out to provide some flexibility on a project. What we really want you guys to be aware of is starting January 1st for your multifamily dwelling units, if you do not use a balanced ventilation system, the ERV, HRV are still extra credit. But if you don't do a balanced ventilation system, what are they going to have to do on the project, Martin? They're going to be required to test each of the dwelling units, and they'll have to do what's called a blower door test to test the amount of leakage on the dwelling unit. It'll be done by a HERS rater. They are allowed to do sampling, so that would be one in seven. If the first one uh, fails, they would have to test the second one. If the second one fails, all seven in that sampling group would have to be tested. Uh, if they fail, then at that stage of the project, they are going to have to go back and fix the leakage on the dwelling unit. So the problem I have with that is that's a very bad time for a failure to occur on the building leakage testing. Okay, let's strip all the drywall out of this uh, particular unit, and let's uh, go in there and fix all those leaks and holes that everybody has uh, created when they put the plumbing systems in, when they put the electrical systems in, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have to go back and, and obviously uh, retest and button the unit back up again. That could be a disaster if you had a 50-unit condo building and um, suddenly we're failing that, uh, you know, two weeks before final. <laughs> That could be a, a real It really disaster. scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. This scares the heebie-jeebies out of me. And um, I'm blessed to have mechanical engineers who have already gone the way of balanced ventilation a couple of years ago. But I know there's quite a few out there who haven't and who kind of making the stance of until you make me. And it makes me really concerned that we're putting off something to the field right before potentially that occupancy permit and hoping and, and praying that things are going to pass because we have so many people touching these apartments. It really scares me. Well, G we had G a great question from... Oh, I was going to say, think, think about it from this Sorry. point of view. So for the engineer, it's like, oh, we're going to put an exhaust system in. So what they're doing is they're passing the buck down to the contractor. Yeah who's going to have to make sure they build a tight envelope. So really, from the mechanical engineer's point of view, it's like, okay, I'm just going to, just going to kick the can down the road right. and it becomes somebody else's problem. And I just think as a contractor, I'd go back and say, nah, we're not doing this. We're doing it this way. That would be my, my viewpoint. In our last session, Martin and I kind of were joking, and, I, and I'm not joking anymore that if I have a project that wants to go um, exhaust only or supply only, I'm going to have a statement be passed around with everyone signing off at the design side, being aware of what that means to the construction practice that has to be achieved out in the field. I want to make it really clear everyone signed up for this. And it wasn't just, well, I'm going to kind of only design this type of system because I always have. So just, just be very careful and concerned about this. We had a question, Martin, about um, where to find information on how to model an ERV and HRV appropriately. I'm pretty darn sure you have an FAQ and a sample file on that. Do you know if Brian Selby has done a Code and Coffee including that? He has not, and that actually would be a good candidate for a Code and Coffee. I think that's a great one we should mention to him. But yes, we do have an FAQ on the website, and you can simply uh, search for the term either ERV or HRV and uh, that will describe uh, how to do it. We also have a question here regarding climatic and geographic design criteria, now refers to ACA Manual J. Is this design criteria already covered by the energy requirements, or is it only mandatory when using man Manual J? There are some subtleties of how it spoke to regarding those load calculations. I know you've got more information on this than I do, Martin. Why don't you answer this one? Um, actually, I'm not that familiar with the oh. <laughs> code section they're talking about here. Um, so this is a residential code requirements, basically saying, hey, you're going to, um, how you're going to do your load calculations. So 
it's ACA Manual J and also Part 11 speaks to ACA Manual J, A, J, S, and D. And it, everyone's kind of aligning in that direction and trying to say things the same way. Got so it, got it. it is covered under the energy code in where it says you will do load calculations. Now, your compliance isn't based on those load calculations, but it is stating you will do load calculations. Part 11 and the residential code then take it even further. So there is some overlap, and there is being aware of what other codes are saying about these particular building features, especially load calculations. Let's talk about what's going on with HERS measures as it applies to just mechanical. So we have, to, uh, there's some nice, still some nice performance options in our back pocket if we so desire to take them regarding using pipe insulation everywhere, not just where it's dictated by the plumbing code. If you want to engage drain water heat recovery, that will need to be verified by a HERS rater. Our duct leakage requirements, duct design, ducts in conditioned space. I think we might see people be using some of these extra credit uh, duct design options more often, Martin. What is involved with taking credit for duct design? Walk us through that. Well, what you're going to have to provide is a set of plans that detail out the specific diameter and length of duct work that you're planning to install. And so that would be a, a design that goes to the building department. And then it would require that the HERS rater come out and in the field they measure and verify both the length and diameter of every segment of duct in the system. So it does require you at permit time to absolutely know what you're going to be installing as far as the duct, the duct system goes. And honestly, I don't see a lot of projects where they even tell me anything about the duct work other than say, eh, the contractor no. will figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is something if we want to homes. engage this type of credit. Yeah. I, I can see it on production homes where, hey, you know, we're going to build 100 yeah. of these homes, so we're going to engineer the whole duct system once for efficiency, and we're good to go. My thing is with CalGreen Part 11 requiring ACA Manual JSD, we should be having them already. And we should have them in place to be able to use for this. And I have definitely had some people go, hey, Gina, I put in 10 feet with that reduce, reduce that surface area. And oh my gosh, it was amazing the compliance margin I got. Mm -hmm. 10 feet of surface area of duck is not realistic whatsoever. So if you're going to use that credit, please be aware that you need to have that duct design, you need to be using realistic numbers, and that HERS rater is going to be looking for that duct design to verify what was input into the software. Mechanical, in terms of indoor air quality, that kitchen range hood and that air filter device, that MERV 13 filter, is now going to be um, part of that HERS rater's purview. Also, the whole house fan. The whole house fan is nothing's new regarding that, except for the fact that if you specify and use a whole house fan, a HERS rater is going to verify that airflow and fan efficacy to make sure it's meeting what's in the CF1R. We're seeing a new high efficiency equipment rating that's going to be verified by the HERS rater, but I'm kind of shocked it wasn't there already. And I see a lot of frowny faces next to the rated heat pump capacity issue. Martin, talk to us about this efficiency requirements and that heat pump capacity issue. So for years, we've been rating heat pumps with HSPF, heat seasonal performance factor. And for years, the Energy Commission has been requiring high efficiency air conditioners to be HERS verified when we take credit for it. They're now also asking for verification of that efficiency on the heating side of heat pump applications. That's pretty reasonable. That's, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. It should have been there probably mm -hmm. a long time ago. Um, the second one, however, is going to be a little more problematic for people using heat pumps, and that is the rated heat pump capacity must be verified in the field. And that means the HERS rater must verify both the 47 degree rating for heat pump capacity as well as a 17 degree rate for heat pump, pump capacity. That introduces two concerns of mine. Uh, first off, I specify in my Title 24 calculations, okay, these guys are going to do a three pump, three ton LG heat pump. Okay, so it goes to the field. Uh, the guy that uh, installs says, well, we sell Daikin, so we're going to put a Daikin system in. Okay, so instead of 36,000, 34,000. Okay, well, that's a fail. It comes back to me that he's got to get recalculated with whatever they changed it over to. Uh, that's my first concern. My second concern is a lot of times 
not a lot of times, the Energy Commission's directories for heat pumps don't list the 17 degree rating for the heat pumps. So that means we're going to have to go to the AHRI directory to get that value. So you guys probably, if you're doing heat pumps, ought to get familiar with that and ought to make sure that rather than the architect saying we're going to put in a three ton heat pump, say what heat pump are you going to put in? Tell me about it because it's going to be verified in the field. I have a feeling it's not if they're going to be using heat pumps, Martin. It's that they're going to have to be doing heat pumps. That's just something we're going to see a lot more of. Getting familiar with the AHRI directory is something I think is essential. If any of you are KBEC members through our share, share source at the KBEC website, there's a little video there that um, Jeff, Jeff Pollock, I think he's on here, I think Jeff put that video together on how to use the AHRI directory and how to get that information, start getting used to it, start getting understanding how you use the AHRI directory. Now that we've gone through mechanical, let's do a check your understandings regarding mechanical changes under the 2019 code. So I've got a few questions for you guys. What MERV rating is going to be required for new HVAC systems under the 2019 code? Well, you guys are fast on the draw on that one. Whoa. <laughs> Question number two. Which of these are going to be allowed without penalty whatsoever for a new home in climate zones 2 through 15? And which of the HERS measures are brand new, we never saw them before, for the 2019 code cycle? And new to multifamily buildings and those new multifamily buildings, which ventilation method is not going to trigger the HERS compartmentalization blower door test of the envelope. We've got some fast people here, Martin. We've got about half of our crowd answering. It looks like that's how many we're going to be getting here. And um, oh, someone just double thought themselves with the MERV filter rating. <laughs> Don't ever go back and change your answer. So almost everyone is saying MERV 13 for the filter. There you go. <laughs> Are they right, Martin? It's MERV 13, and it needs to be a two-inch filter depth. If you want to go with a one-inch filter depth, then you will be required to put in a much larger filter. Which of the following water heaters are allowed without penalty for brand new homes in climate zones 2 through 15, Martin? Well, of course, we can put in any number of gas tankless water heaters. We talked about that. Uh, electric water heaters, absolute no-no. Okay, electric tankless. But we can do the NIA uh, Tier 3 heat pump uh, water heater as an option as well. Which HERS measures are brand spanking new for the 2019 code cycle? It's like everybody got it correct. Uh, kitchen hood ventilation verification. Uh, we've got the whole house fan for ventilation cooling. Oh, sorry. Uh, somebody put down AC system air handler fan water drawer. That is not new. It is something we've had in the code cycles. Uh, it's just that it has a new level of testing for furnace AC systems. But I'm going to give it to them anyway because we have some new requirements about it. What's brand spanking new is that kitchen hood and whole house fan for ventilation cooling. And we've got everyone totally understanding what's going on with multifamily ventilation here, Martin. Has everyone got it correct? Yes, they do, and I'm glad to see that. Same here. Okay, thank you everyone. Let's go back to our presentation and start talking about all the tremendous changes that are happening with lighting. I'm totally lying. There is very little changes happening with lighting. We've had some major changes happen with lighting. It's in a good place. Let's keep it there. So, and that's really what we're seeing reflected in this next code cycle. We do have a new flavor of lighting for night lights, step lights, and path lights. If you want to use a night light, and these are hardwired, not the ones that you're plugging in to an outlet, but hardwired night light, step lights, and path lights. And if you want to put in a product that exceeds 5 watts or 150 lumens, for the very first time for residential, we're not just looking at watts, we're also looking at lumens. If you want to exceed those, you'll have to put in a vacancy sensor as controlling those, and you'll have to make sure each of those light sources is JA8 certified. Huh. I think that's going to be really close to impossible. Basically, 
don't exceed 5 watts or 150 lumens, walk away, call it done. Light sources internal to drawers, cabinets, or linen closets, same thing. If you want to put in something that exceeds 5 watts or 150 lumens, you will have to use a vacancy sensor. And I just got to tell you, a vacancy sensor for a drawer light just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and it would have to be JA8 certified. You will have to put in a control that, that turns the light off when you close the drawer, cabinet, or linen closet automatically. To me, that just makes sense. The only thing that I'm a little um, sad about, Martin, potentially is when I have a glass-fronted cabinet in my kitchen and I want to have it illuminated, um, that's the only thing I'm a little concerned about. How do I go about achieving that in this next code cycle? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd target keeping them under 5 watts, you know, to 5 watts or less. And, uh, you know, the smaller, smaller LEDs will get you there all day long. And, and at 5 watts, it's say 60 lumens per watt. You know, 80 lumens per watt. That's well, no, that exceeds the uh, 150 lumens. Oops. <laughs> yeah, it might be tricky. <laughs> well, and that also, I would have to have that control that automatically turns the light off and the cabinet door is closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Glass fronted cabinets might be a little bit of an issue. Yeah. So uh, controls. <laughs> We're used to having vacancy sensor controls, and there's nothing new here, everyone. Bathrooms, garages, laundry rooms, and utility rooms, at least one fixture in those rooms must be controlled with the vacancy sensor. What's new, Martin? Well, the Energy Commission is giving us the option now of installing either a vacancy-based or occupancy-based sensor. In the case of a vacancy-based sensor, uh, you have to turn the light on manually when you enter the room. It will turn off automatically. In the case of an occupancy sensor, however, you walk into a room, the lights turn on, you leave the room, the lights turn off. Now, the rationale here is most manufacturers now have an all-in-one product. It's field settable to be either occupancy or vacancy based. And um, you can go down to your home improvement store and you'll look, they're stocking one device now that does both. And that makes a lot of sense for them. So, totally makes sense. This is a code change. It's like, okay, I can see this. It's kind of nice. They're seeing what's going on with the industry. We do have some changes regarding what the certification requirements are for a product to be considered JA8. Um, we don't really have to worry about this unless someone here in the room is a manufacturer, and they actually are making things easier. They're lining things up more with the Title 20 requirements uh, that are required for general service LED and small diameter LED. What's nice for all of us, especially our contractors, our distributors, is that anything that is marked JA8 2016 will be allowed to be used in the next code cycle in addition to anything that's marked JA8 2019 E being associated with anything in an enclosed environment. So we're immediately going to have a lot of product available at the beginning of our next code cycle because everything that works in current code is going to work in the next code cycle. That's it to what's going on with lighting, Martin. Yep, pretty simple changes there, as expected. Let's talk about PV plus flexibility. So for new homes, there is a new prescriptive requirement, and this also includes new multifamily buildings, three habitable stories or less. That requirement's going to be based on the conditioned floor area of the dwelling units, not of the common areas for multifamily, just the dwelling units. And we do have some exceptions that allow us some alternative sizing to those particular PV systems. And there's also some options to potentially look and use a community solar and or battery system. What would that look like for a project to be able to use a community solar system, Martin? Well, let's take an example. I've got a, uh, a new apartment uh, complex going in, and maybe it's three stories tall, and it's going to be in a, you know, a high dollar value area like Irvine or something. You know, real estate's pretty valuable there. Uh, I've got a roof that's got a lot of condensers up there because we're doing split systems and all that, BRFs or whatever. And I'm finding that you know, I'm a little short on space here to put my, my solar requirement in. This option allows you to locate off-site somewhere, a solar farm that would provide the solar benefit to that building. And that would supply it into the Edison grid. Maybe you'd go east of Irvine, find a cheap piece of land out there, put in your solar farm. 
use that to feed back into the Edison grid, your building in Irvine pulls back out again. So it's an interesting option. We're not sure how much people will be taking advantage of it. Uh, that remains to be seen. So I talked about how we have our PV sizing based on a, a conditioned floor area. I forgot I had the slide that talked about <laughs> that community solar. Martin totally talked us through it already without the pretty picture, so I'm going to go on to my next slide. And this is this table that we now have in our standards that gives us the formula to figure out what is that prescriptive KW sizing that I need to be aware of for my home. Now, you're uh, hopefully aware that the software is going to be doing it for you automatically if you use the performance approach. But I've been sharing this with my architects and designers so that they have a good feel of what they're going to be expected to do while they're designing the home. Before they've gotten to me, they can get a comfort level on how they're going about figuring out how much PV is needed. Martin, how do I use this table? Well, the first factor involved here is what climate zone you're in. And uh, that determines the factors A and B that are used in the equation here. Uh, factor A is multiplied by the conditioned floor area. And then factor B is multiplied by the number of dwelling units. And so you'll see, for instance, if you're in climate zone 3, factor A is down at uh, 0.628. But if you're a more extreme climate zone, like 15, that would be like Palm Springs, that factor jumps to 1.56. So in, in zones with more uh, solar availability, they're asking for more PV. An example of a home in LA, climate zone 9, you'd see that they would ask for 2.62 kW. If we go to an apartment building, 30 unit in, say, Oakland, we would see something closer to 47 kW. And that factors in that you've got more dwelling units in there and that increases the size of the PV system. And that's a pretty big PV system. I, I'm not really, honestly, concerned so much about single-family homes. I am concerned about that budget impact for multifamily construction, of which we need so desperately here in California. It'll be interesting to see what happens. And that might um, move more towards maybe that community solar situation that we were talking about, Martin. Now, the Energy Commission doesn't want you to cut down trees just to put up a PV system. So there is this, um, we look at, is that site, is that roof in a location in which it has good solar access? Now, you don't get to design in factors that shade the roof, and Martin will talk about that in a little bit. It's about what is already the limitations of the site because of trees, because you're surrounded by large high-rise buildings, because you have a huge mountain behind you. Maybe there's all these factors outside the control of the design of the building that reduce the solar access. And what the code is looking for is that you have at least 80 square feet of one solid area that has a 70% solar access that 70% of the year sun is hitting that location that makes a PV system a cost-effective, viable option for the project. And Martin, what do I, how am I going to prove my solar access isn't good enough? Well, there hasn't been any approved, approved tools yet. But the Energy Commission will be approving solar assessment tools that we can use to determine if we do, in fact, have substantial shading from things like trees. Now, it's important to understand here that we're talking about externalized factors here. If you happen to be a designer that likes to put in north-facing shed roofs, that's not going to be an excuse to say, look at me, I don't have any solar access. It's like, well, guess what? You need to redesign that roof system so you do, in fact, have the necessary solar access. But if you've got something like trees, maybe you're in Mill Valley with, you know, 70 foot redwood trees all around, then we get it. It's, it's shaded. You're, you're going to be off the hook there. So there are some exceptions that we can look at that allow us to think alternatively how we look at designing our system. This particular video is showing an example of a home that has some trees. But throughout the year, I still really have that 70% solar access. It's only a small segment of the year that those um, trees are really shading my PV system. 
So it's an example basically of, yeah, you might have some trees, and you might still very well be able to show solar access due to um, how the orientation of everything going on there. So here's the list of exceptions, or I like to consider them alternative pathways to show compliance to PV. I like to look at things simply. So first of all, we are looking at roofs that are faced, uh, that are um, in the azimuth between 90 and 300 degrees. So like Martin was saying, we don't want north-facing roofs. We want a roof facing between 90 and 300 degrees, and that it has that 70% solar access, and that I have at least 80 square feet of continuous, grouped together, solid, all in one spot area. If I cannot meet that requirement, PV is exempt, and this is the only one of these exceptions that's actually allowing you to not have PV at all. Some of these others are about being able to adjust your allowance. So if you can get that 80 square feet in and at least 70% solar access with those azimuth that I want, well, let's look at number of stories associated with the building. If it's a two-story building, will you have more conditioned floor area? And remember, your allowance is based on conditioned floor area, but you're not having any more roof area. You just have a second story. Same thing with a three-story building. I've got three stories. I have even less roof area associated with a much larger conditioned floor area. They're giving you some numbers that are going to adjust your PV, taking that into consideration. One of the ones I find interesting here in Climate Zone 15, this is not an exception. This is saying we want even more. So in Climate Zone 15, in which there's a lot of sun, they're saying, you know what? You're going to be using your air conditioning a lot. And we want to have a PV system that's going to be sized to handle that additional load. Martin, why don't you tell them about what's going on here with this battery exception? So one of the options you can have under prescriptive compliance is the ability to reduce the installed PV by 25% from that table we showed you in the prior slide. Uh, that requires the installation of a minimum 7.5 kWh battery. However, under the performance approach, you can drop down to as small as 5 kWh on the battery. Uh, that's not to say you'll get a 25% reduction on the PV. It'll probably be closer to 20% or thereabouts. But you could also go to a bigger battery. Maybe you went to a 10 kWh battery and use that as a way to reduce your photovoltaic. I think it is important, however, that you consider what are the costs associated with the battery systems versus the cost associated with the reduction in the photovoltaic system. Way, it, way that way the uh, pros and cons based upon that. And availability of the technology too. I, as we mentioned earlier, Tesla battery walls have, have been very popular. And there was a time period in which they weren't manufacturing, they were redoing, ramping how they were making them, this and that. And there was like a six month waiting list for those. And all of this technology has to be in place before that final occupancy permit for everything to go smoothly. So really being aware of what are, are your solutions that you're choosing and are they going to be in place for that final occupancy permit. So when we're talking about PV, we're kind of pretty much done. And let's do a check your understanding. You guys have been a relatively quiet group. I'm hoping if you have any questions on PV, on battery, and how this is all going to work for you, do feel free to type that into that webinar chat. So here I've got a CF1R per form for you. My very first question is, what does this represent? Is this a new home? Is this an addition? Is this an alteration? Do you have enough here? And I got to tell you, you do. You have enough information here to tell you whether this CF1R perf applies to a new home, addition, or alteration. When I take a look at this CF1R perf form, can you tell me the KW size that's being, um, that is required as a standard design KW in terms of the requirements, the prescriptive requirements. And then I'd like you to be able to type something in. What would be the impact of installing a PV system that's twice the KW of that standard design capacity? What are you going to do? What might happen when you're oversizing double what the prescriptive requirement is calling for? So it looks like we've got everyone answering our first question here, Martin, and they've got it down. Is this performance calculation for a new home addition or alteration, Martin? Well, clearly the fact that we've got an EDR score on here tells us this is a new construction project. 
you're only going to see the EDR score for a new home. I had someone ask me the other day, Gina, I'm trying to look for the EDR score because I want to uh, figure out some of my PV sizing for this home, and it, it's disappeared. I can't, I can't find it anywhere. And finally, they had to send me their BLD file, Martin, for me to go, oh, you're trying to find it for an E plus A project. It's not going to show up for that. It's a common one. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's, let, let's just repeat that for everybody's benefit. In Title 24, current and 2019, you cannot claim any benefit for photovoltaic systems on any type of addition or alteration project. Only for new construction projects will PV and or batteries be recognized. And it uh, looks like everyone here, majority of the people are saying the standard design PVKW for this home is 2.47. We had quite a few people choose 5. Martin, what is this 5KW that we're seeing here on this CF1R per form? Yeah, it, this is kind of a trick question for you guys. The standard design is what's in the energy budget, and that's being reported here as 2.47. However, what is required to be installed is listed in the bottom left-hand corner, and based upon what we put into the energy model in this case, we are required to install at least a 5KW PV system. So in this case, we're seeing that they're oversizing their PV system by 21%. What's going to be that impact of doubling the size of the KW from the standard design? What do I have to make? Is this going to be okay? Well, and uh, a few people have already said it here. Um, yeah, they're getting it. <laughs> not recommended to sell extra PV back to your utility company. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I have to agree with that. <laughs> I, I overproduce and I get pennies on the dollar. <laughs> um, you may violate your NEM rules and that type of thing. Uh, so really what it comes down to is you want to be careful about how big that PV system is because I've worked on a number of projects where people have come to me and said, Martin, we want you to justify this humongous PV system we're going to put in. The utilities are saying it's too big. And I had one the other day where I said, sorry, I can't justify the size you're putting in. It's, it's, it's way over what the, what the energy tools are predicting you need on that. And uh, you know, it way exceeds the 5% limitation. So Elizabeth is asking, what is this NEM rule? What is it that you're talking about? And how is this applying to these types of projects? So NEM stands for net energy metering. And um, net energy metering basically says, hey, uh, you guys are going to use some of our electricity. You're going to give us back some electricity. And so we have a net energy situation going on. If you give us back a little bit more than you use, that's OK. Uh, but if you give us back too much, that suddenly makes you into a local power plant. We don't like local power plants, OK? You're taking away our business. So the net energy metering rule set by the California Public Utilities Commission generally says you can't overproduce by more than 5% of what you use in a year. I also understood it to be that it's a way of managing the grid also. Well, of course. Um, if of course. we have electricity going back and forth all over the places, we're really causing a hardship on how that energy is being transferred and what it's doing to our transformer stations. That's, that's very true, and quite frankly, uh, overproducing, uh, I do it, but overproducing um, is not an economically viable approach to things. They, they pay you back, to, you, they charge you 20 cents to, to use it, they should pay you 3 cents back to, for anything excess you produce. <laughs> so, uh, Excellent, everyone. Let's go back to our presentation. We're going to start wrapping things up for you, and um, I'm assuming a lot of you have questions about what's going on with the software, even though you've all been very quiet. <laughs> so let's talk about what's going on with the software, Martin. What's going on? OK. Uh, the residential software. The Energy Commission uh, did approve the Seabeck Rens engine on uh, the 515 business meeting. Uh, so that's out there, all ready to go. Um, we, on the Energy Pro side, uh, did submit a couple of months ago uh, Energy Pro 8. And that has that exact same engine in there. Um, that has all the certification tests uh, passing uh, with a 0.00% tolerance. So we're meeting all the, all the tests. Uh, we kind of told the Energy Commission at the time we're not in any rush because we're going to wait on the non-residential side. Um, we've since decided that they're going to 
push us into the uh, certification meeting for September. The reason we told them we were not in any rush to get certified is that it's not going to do you any good to produce a certificate of compliance with Energy Pro 8 because none of the HERS providers will be approved until the October business meeting. So that means no matter if you use CBEC mm -hmm. Res or use Energy Pro 8, you won't be able to get the official certificate of compliance stamped by the HERS providers. So for that reason, you, uh, we encourage you to get the software, whether it's CBEC Res, whether it's Energy Pro, get it now, start looking at your projects, get a feel for how compliance is going to fall for next mm -hmm. year, and get up to speed and get educated. Uh, there's a lot of interesting surprises you'll find uh, when it comes to modeling certain things. You know, Gina was talking about uh, the, the modeling of the ERVs. She was talking about the modeling of the QII and the deltas we're seeing there. These are all things you want to start to educate yourself on, particularly in your, in your uh, climate zone. And those designers and architects in the room, be asking your energy consultants to do it for you, maybe with a project you've done in the last couple years, so you can start getting a feel of that also. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. You have all of our contact information, including my, uh, my team uh, behind the hood. And Daryl even did things a little bit extra for me this afternoon. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, the hotline is always a great resource. I do recommend you email because it's so much better to get something in writing. Jill Marver is our manager for the Decoding Talk program. If you have any questions, concerns, or kudos, do feel free to contact her directly. Thank you yet again for an amazing code year, what's changing to coding box.